Hello and welcome to the Frank Fryer channel. And if you like my content, please make sure to give the channel a subscribe. It really does help me grow my Carmelite spiritual ministry. So today is the second video of a four video part on discernment, but discernment from a Carmelite perspective, which focuses on utilizing and understanding the choices we make and how do we live them out to grow in deeper communion with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so today I wanted to focus on sort of, for lack of a better word, you know, the demons of ministry. If we look at Teresa of Avila and she says the life we cultivate in prayer leads to a life of action. What she fundamentally teaches through the interior castle is we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, are called to be people of prayer and people of ministry. So today I wanted to focus on issues that arise with sort of our ministerial lives. And I don't mean, you know, if you're just a minister in the church, this goes to all sort of charitable activities that you might be partaking in in your own life and even maybe aspects with your work. But it's really that active dimension of the human person. So we're all called to have some sort of positive impact and action in the world, to be like a Martha out into the world. And when we focus on sort of, you know, those aspects of ourselves, and we put them in sort of an inordinate relationship, and we don't spend time reflecting and reviewing on them and trying to get self-knowledge about ourselves in the midst of those actions and understanding our attachments in those actions. And where do our feelings upset where our faith is at in those actions? And how are we open to community in those actions? We can get off the mark if we don't use those tools mentioned in part one of this video series on discernment. You know, because all of our, our Christian actions in the world should always lead us to a deeper communion with Jesus Christ. So today I just want to look at four different sort of demons or negative aspects of our, of our active life, our ministerial life, that can really show how we're off the mark and how when we sort of cast aside those different tools of discernment, these negative aspects of the ministerial life grow. Now this is not going to be an exhaustive list. This is just a couple of little insights. There are many other issues that can evolve certain problems in our life in relationship to our ministerial life. And the first one is Messiahism. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus Christ is our Messiah. But when we sort of take on a ministry to the point that we see ourselves as the pilot and God is the co-pilot, we sort of become the atlas that holds up everything. If I didn't hold up everything, it would all just come crumbling down. Well, then we sort of fall into this demonic, for lack of a better word, trap. You know, what does, have to, what does God have to do with any of our work? You know, and in this sort of messianism, you know, our feelings really drive us along the way because, you know, our ministerial activities can make us feel really good. So we suddenly, through our feelings, get put at the center of things and our faith that points to the reality that God is the one that makes things happen. God is the foundation of everything sort of gets put to the side. So I'm the pilot. God, if I get into trouble, you know, I'll turn to you. You know, our activities take the biggest part of our labors, not our prayer, because if we did that and we allowed Christ to sort of show we're getting off the mark and he needs, you know, to really take control of this thing, we would probably run away because that's what our feelings are telling us to do. So this sort of messianism, where we view ourselves as the preeminent figure, as the savior involved in this cause, whatever it may be. The second point is activism. Now, actions in the world are a great thing, but activism, particularly if you're doing Christian kind of work, can be deadly to a soul because activism is all about sort of transforming our work as our prayer. And we work, we work, we work, we work, we work, you know, it sort of fuels that workaholicism, you know, where, you know, we always got to keep going. We always got to keep doing, we got to keep saving. We got to keep doing these things, this, that, and the other. And, you know, well, I don't have time to sit down and sort of pray with Jesus of using and sort of allowing the scriptures to transform my life or to make time for confession and all these sort of things. Activism, this sort of, you know, this, this demon of ministry, activism, pushes us along. And it's really keeping us from any sort of self-knowledge because we're in too much action to slow down, to reflect on oneself. What's going on inside of me? Am I really necessary for this project? Should I be leading this project? Are there better leaders out there than me? 
Is this an action that Jesus has called me to? Or has he called me to something else? So activism really sort of keeps us dull to ourselves, keeps us from gaining self-knowledge because we can't slow down just to sit with ourselves because our prayer has become our work. You know, and that, I'm not a big fan of that message. Well, my work is my prayer. No, work is not your prayer. Work is a type of prayer, but it can't be everything. Even Jesus himself had to go off into the silence to sit and just be with the Father. We have to be likewise. So if Messianism sort of keeps us from connecting our faiths and our feelings and, and sort of allowing our feelings to trump our faith, this activism can really keep us from growing in any sort of self-knowledge, which can keep communion and that deeper communion that we're all striving for through our active life with Christ impossible. So the next thing is preferring some people over other people, sort of factionism, developing factions, um, for lack of a better word, community is of the utmost importance. And not just people we like, you know. I've met many people that I love and I pray for, but at times I just don't like who they are as a person. Their personality, my personality, rubs me the wrong way. But Jesus Christ, the majority of times, chooses to teach me through those kind of people in my life. But if we just allow people around us that sort of suit our sensibilities of who we are as a person, you know, that sort of maybe build up our ego, that tell us we're great, and we need people like those, don't get me wrong, but if those are the only people, if that's the only community we have, for lack of, you know, for, and I keep using that phrase a lot, I'm sorry, but, you know, sort of we get these sycophants around us that just sort of, you know, echo in our ears of how great we are. Well, part of the Christian life is fraternal correction. Jesus corrected people. We need to be open to being corrected in my life, in our lives, and in my life in particular, because if I'm not careful, you know, my ego could really get out of control and cause a lot of damage. So I listen to the parishioners that have been here for several generations. Their families have been here in this area, and I learn from them in order to serve the community better. It's not about what I want all the time. And if I just have people around me that tell me what I want to hear, well, I can't really go in deeper communion because I will be consumed by fear of going into the deeper water. Why would I go into deeper water? I don't know what's there. I know it's in this water. This water's safe. These people tell me what I like to hear. These people make me feel awesome. There's no growth there. And when we grow in communion with Christ, it's a rich soil, you know, as an analogy that allows us to grow. So another demon of ministry is just, you know, preferring some people to other and having that form factions that really keep us from having healthy communities that allow good discernment for communion to grow. And finally, this one's a little broad, but it is really, really, really dangerous. And that is envy. Envy is that sin that really keeps us from rejoicing another's good. You know, and in ministerial life or active lives, it can really show in indirect ways, sometimes in passive, you know, aggressive behavior. But we really see this in forms of rivalry because envy tries to encourage us along to seek our own kingdom and what we want in our own kingdom. And when we see someone that has something that might be just a little bit better than our kingdom or they have something that we don't have in our kingdom yet. We push them aside. We cast them away. We try to tear them down because our envy doesn't allow us to rejoice with them. It keeps us from being that kind person like Jesus Christ is and Jesus Christ calls us to be. So this envy in our ministerial life, you know, this someone comes in, you know, for me, I'll use myself as an example. You know, a guest uh, visiting priest comes in. And people say, oh, you have such a great homily, and you're awesome, and you're wonderful, and this and that and the other. And if I'm rooted in envy, I can't rejoice that the people got some good spiritual nourishment from this guy. I'm going to be upset that he stole my thunder. And then from that, I might build, you know, a group around myself that tries to keep him from coming back again. Now, this is a hypothetical situation. Has it happened in the world? Possibly. You know, envy is just one of those insidious things that creeps down into us because of our attachments. 
It tries to obscure what we are attached to in relationship to our own kingdom instead of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the kingdom that we're all called to, the kingdom we build our own little cell, our own little cells in hell. So as we go forward and we reflect on our sort of active life, our ministerial life, in this discernment for deeper communion, when we live these choices and these ministries that we have embraced maybe through our parishes or through nonprofit organizations, you know, these are just some areas that can really present us a deeper challenge. When we think that we are the Savior, when we think that our work is our prayer, when we form factions because we prefer some people over others, and we're envious, we form rivalry with other people, we can't rejoice with them. So as you go forward, desiring to go into a deeper communion with Jesus Christ and discerning how to do that with the choices that you have made with your life, these four things I brought up today shows what happens if you sort of kick back and off to the side one of those different tools I gave in another video on discernment. So, my brothers and sisters, if you found this video helpful to yourself today, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. It really does help me. If you want more of my content, visit my website, thefrankfriar.com. That's Friar, F-R-I-A-R, thefrankfriar.com. There you can find my weekly blog. You can find links to my podcast. You can find links to my articles at the Catholic Stand and just pictures from my activities around the world. I'm also on Twitter at Carmelite Nick, or you can just always search The Frank Friar and I'll come up. If you want to contact me, go to my website and please fill out the contact form and send your request to me. If you want me to pray for something, fill it out and send it in and I'll be happy to do it. If you're discerning a vocation to religious life or the priesthood, there's a vocation link on my website. Fill it out and I'll be happy to speak with you about these things. Again, my brothers and sisters, we're all called to have some sort of charitable activity in our life because it's through charity that we grow in sync with the love of Jesus Christ. But it's when we allow that to become off the mark, to allow our attachments to twist how our ministerial lives are, that we cease to grow in that deeper communion with maybe great choices that we've made. So remember, you're not alone in your travels. You're not alone in this discernment. I'm praying for you. And know that God is with you every step of the way. Thank you. Have a good day. And God bless.